Hello, this is Stephen Coughlin from Unconstrained Analytics, and I'm going to bring you the final of the uh, discussions on how the left operates through this briefing called um, Dialogue and Praxis, the Dialogue Praxis Process. It is really how we want people to understand how Marxism actually operates so that we can really understand how to, to visualize things as they're happening today in a way that gives us the ability to create predictive capabilities and also in a way that allows us to uh, then form responses to them as opposed to anything that might be just a little bit too tactical for our own ability to be successful. So we've already really gone through uh, how it works and it's so important because it's kind of the code in, that makes things work. And then we gave a couple demonstrative examples. We so, showed how the political, the, um, the narrative the, the dialogue praxis um, operates. And then we showed how it's in, in a political warfare regime. And then we showed how it, 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 it is the strategic side or the non-violent end of what we see in insurgency paradigms. Uh, then we provided a demonstrative example. We did these up front so you could see that this is the product of this type of analysis and to show that we got it right. So what I want to do is then run through this and say the demonstrative example we used, of course, was intersectionality. So with what we're going to do in this presentation, we are going to show um, first part five, the narrative build of the overlay on top of the dialogue praxis overlay. Remember, we're doing overlays like you're creating this thing and you put it on a map and it creates this picture, that you put another overlay and it creates this picture, and all of a sudden with a series of overlays on a map, you then start to see where you can attack, where the other side is going to attack, and what are the limiting factors. So this is the kind of the visual we're trying to create here, but we're doing it in a, in a political warfare narrative context. And in, in that regard, remember, we're kind of using the what's called the doctrinal template. We're arranging these how they perfectly arrange themselves as if there were no considerations. But in fact, there are always considerations. But we want just to kind of lay down the pure argument. So part five is the narrative build on the dialogue praxis overlay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to then go to the narrative arc and use the military engagement metaphor. We really want to steer people off the literary or the political science metaphor because from our perspective or my perspective, it's just a, it's just a sinkhole and you cannot generate a response. And in fact, I'll argue that's the, that's the intent of getting lost in these narrative discussions of Marxism, getting involved in uh, academic political science discussions. It's a, it's, it's a sinkhole. It is really a pseudo reality. So with that, I'm, I'm just noticing my screen is freezing, so this may be a retake. So, uh, so after the military engagement metaphor, because this is political warfare, remember, political warfare is warfare. And that doesn't change just because our senior national security elements don't understand that. The Chinese have said they understand that, and they understand we have no concept of it. I think Al-Qaeda's whole premise of success depended on it. And I'd like to ask you, who's really winning in that? Okay, who really won? And I will fully acknowledge that we could win every tactical engagement and lose the strategic end, just like, I don't know, Vietnam. We still have troops in Korea. This is the cost of not having a strategic design. So I, I just think it's very important to do that. So with that, we'll go to the, um, the narrative built overlay of the, of the dialogue praxis overlay, which we've already seen. So let's review this. We have each of those little green things is what we're calling a dialogue or a dialectical event. And that's important because you string them out over time in what's called a period of praxis. And that's what you see. So at the bottom left, you see that the first series of dialogues are below in, in, in the real world. And they wanna start creating terms and, 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 and memes that get you in your world to start hearing what they're saying and get used to what they're saying as they increase their tempo to rise you above that, one, that line. And that line is where all of a sudden their ability to control, have a narrative has you responding to them in what we'll call their pseudo reality. And that's what you see right there. You see a pseudo reality imposed on top of of, of the um, dialogue praxis process, which is designed to allow this to happen. 
So what are we really talking about? In the pseudo-reality, remember, a pseudo-reality is something that is not true. It is a fiction. It is always a fiction. And it's always important that you realize that. And one of the things we've built into this is something called the binary retreat. And I want to point out it's largest at the beginning, and it tapers off toward the end. And we're going to have a discussion of what we mean by binary retreat, because, of course, we use the word retreat, but it's not always a retreat. Okay, so binary retreat is not a part of the line of effort, the target of the attack, but rather is associated with the period of praxis. It borrows from secret society practices, praxis, of developing terms with dual definitions. The non-initiate, that's anybody who's not a part of a game, hasn't got the game book, okay, that's you, okay. The non-initiate definitions for common use has a pedestrian meaning that is non-alerting, diverting, or calming. It's how we understand those words, not understanding there's a initiate meaning of the same word. So the initiate definitions are the internally are internally defined along ideological and operational lines. Initiate definitions are withheld or denied from common use by practice. So for example, through science of reason, remember science of reason is the taking your political or ideological view and saying it's science and imposing on people, okay? For example, through science of reason, attack narratives are wrapped in scientific garb, afforded the status of science, and explained through manufactured scientized language, which allows only properly trained initiates to use them. How about advanced soft science degrees? I'll get back to that and kind of circle back on that. If you are not an initiate, you are not qualified. Citizens are increasingly not qualified in this process. What process? The process to exercise your right to free speech. The process for you to have a free and open discussion on politics. You see, you're being disqualified from you. And that's the point. So what do I mean by binary treat? We know that there is a counter state activity. We know that Marcuse back in the 1960s basically said that, or excuse me, the early 1970s said that they want to create a counter state operation to bring their neo Marxist views in line with the long march, the Maoist insurgency model, and they wanted to base the center of their operations, the start point, in the academy. So we know that the academy is a central point of focus. So what would happen, you know, just think outside the box here. I know this is really going to be hard. It shouldn't be, but it's really going to be hard. What if, um, what if um, Marcuse actually succeeded in establishing the academy, the college campuses, as the, the, the ground zero counter state operations moving forward? Well, not only would they be, have the ability to control who gets the advanced degrees and who gets into the advanced degree programs, but they could slowly manipulate those the, 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 the soft science, especially soft science, uh, degrees. So if the left established a counterstate presence in the academy, as Marcuse said, one which should at least be looking for highly politicized or ideologically supercharged uh, programs over time. We want to at least watch for a gatekeeping operation as who, who gets in them. Who gets in the master's and doctoral degrees? Who gets into the elite MBA programs who can move forward in, 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 in corporate America? And you realize he talked about this 50 years ago. So I think we really need to look at this. So more, understand, more, more discussion on the binary. There's a defensive role for it. All of a sudden, people are sniffing out that the left has maybe exceed, exceeded their bandwidth and they have to go to ground. They basically have to retreat. They step back to a politically benign posture as conditions require. When doing so, their language reverts to the non-initiate language and usage. Political postures assumes benign postures until conditions favor re-engagement. For example, democracy has a dual meaning. You know, the frustrating thing is, unless we get them to say democracy and there's a hammer and sickle next to it, our side doesn't even think 
to analyze when someone in the leadership of the Democratic Party uses the word democracy, that it has a binary application that seems to be resonating with those, you know, Antifa types who say they're overtly Marxist. And that's a hit on us. But it also has an offensive application, mass line preparation through the period of praxis. You know, for example, throw out a provocative statement or an accusation early in a cycle and even get attacked for saying it by your own, but then step back from that statement and assess the responses and then develop mass line enforcement narratives for future exploitation. So would you like me to give you some examples of this? Democratic congressman saying Bush lied, people died at President Bush's State of the Union address where all the Democrats right afterwards condemned him, but within a month, they were all using the Bush lied narrative. That was pre-operational mass line prep that was exploited. How about in the 2012 presidential elections where both Romney and the RNC was completely put on their back by the war on women? They ended up using to blitz the election. Well, of course, Stephanopoulos put that out there months earlier. That's an example of pre-operational mass line uh, narrative prep that Stephanopoulos, of course, did exploit. How about uh, then Congressman, now Minnesota Attorney General Ellison signaling alignment with Antifa, literally saying, if I am the Attorney General, I will enforce Antifa concepts of the rule of law, which, by the way, are revolutionary and seek to overthrow the rule of law in the state of Minnesota as your Attorney General. That's what that was signaling. So Ellison's, uh, when he so when Ellison signaled alignment with Antifa, then just a month before, you know, started supporting CARE, Council of American Islamic Relations, prior to the Minneapolis event, he was basically signaling an endorsement of violence. And pre that was pre-operational mass line prep. But he also did something else. If you go back to those Minneapolis riots, remember, in a very kind of uncomfortable way, Ellison declared street violence that was obviously BLM and Antifa to anybody watching it at the time, that it was white supremacism, and he buried it. But it's going, they laid down the marker that they will come back. So just watch for the pre-operational mass line prep so that mass line, so that white supremacism will be exploited. And of course, Podesta signaled secession of the, of the West Coast, okay, if Trump wins the election. Well, you know, our site once looked at it as rhetoric. I think people should take it as deadly serious. So they laid down a marker. The pre-operational mass line prep for, uh, for exploitation, both the Ellison white supremacist and the Podesta uh, West Coast secession, arguably are both unlawful, okay? Arguably are both laid down and they're operative right now and they need to be analyzed. In the world of political warfare analysis and preparation to, to do this, this is, this is pre-operational signaling of IPE and OPE, intelligence preparation of the environment and operational preparation of the environment. It's a classic example of open planning that reveals a total disregard for the opposition. It targets, that would be us, the Republican leadership in those communications. So, with that, I would like to point out that this total lack of regard and op open planning can go all the way back to the 1999 thesis by the two Chinese colonels at the Chinese War College called Unrestricted Warfare. They've been open, openly saying this for a long time, knowing that we would not rise to the occasion. So after you've done that, after you've created the pseudo reality, you, you, you look at the zone of exploitation, which was within the pseudo reality. I want you to look at that. And it's red. And we're going to see that red takes on different meanings depending on how you want to apply it as we show it. You determine where the inflection points are, and then you build engagement zones in that to exploit later on. And I want you to kind of take a look right now that that exploitation phase only starts when they're starting to rise above the mean, where those pseudo-reality memes and narratives have, have gotten enough control so they can start leveraging them, which is way before they actually bring violence in the street, as we saw with the insurgency pyramid. So, Note that the negative begins below the line of negation and ends above it. And let's take a look at the matrix metaphor. The AKA reality, the real, the unsuited reality. The blue pill domain 
is that narrative, the pseudo-reality, and that gray area is enforcing the blue pill domain. So it's the narrative of the blue pill domain that enforces the matrix in that gray area. And so you can see that everything in there is a part of a pseudo-reality. And what you also see is the red pill universe is completely outside of it. So that if you want to attack inside that blue pill domain, if you're not doing so from inside the red, you're not actually fighting it at all. And in fact, you're instantiating the blue pill domain as the basis for the attack. So because the blue pill domain is a narrative, it's what determines the time and the place of, uh, of exploitation and enforcement. It's the narrative. And you'll see it's at the point where the binary retreat is really in deep stages of, re of, being, uh, of receding. So I like to point out that this is also the domain of jujitsu. We were, we're going to jujitsu them and beat them at their own game. That's where that happens. Can you see what the problem is? To jujitsu ju the left in their own game, in their blue pill domain, is to become captured by it and to be rendered combat ineffective and to become an obstacle for the red pill people you think are on your side when they're trying to fight it, but are they on your side if you are leveraging only your blue pill understanding of the nature of events? And that's where we're going back to this uh, slide we gave early on in explaining that the goal of the left in the blue pill domain is simply to hold you in place while you, be, while you are dialectically negated, while you jujitsu him at his game for as long as he requires you to be there. So, Going back to it, the blue pill domain, how about debating Marxism by debating Das Kapital? How about debating intersectionality by debating the merits of intersectionality? Well, once you're there, you've already accepted their narrative as the basis for argument. And at that point, you become an obstacle to, to the people trying to defend America in the red pill domain. So I just like to go back to this abuse of language, abuse of power. Uh, when you establish that the, the, the core attack, the main effort, the whole effort of the left is to invest in, in narratives that become enforcement narratives, that become command and control narratives, that is the, that is the center mass of where you start from. It is, it is um, the game. So I want to read this quote from Joseph Piper. It is entirely possible that the true and authentic reality is being drowned out by countless superficial information bits, noisily and breathlessly prevented, presented in propaganda fashion. Consequently, one may be entirely knowledgeable about the thousands of details and nevertheless, because of ignorance regarding the core of the matter, remain without basic instinct. This is a phenomenon in itself already quite astonishing and disturbing. It is a fundamental ignorance created by technology and nourished by information. Please notice, this is about people fighting in the blue pill world, fighting in the pseudo reality. And that's the point of that statement. So let's take a look at this again. From a political warfare point of view, we're basically saying the main actor is the nonviolent actor. It's not Al Qaeda, it's the Brotherhood. It's not Antifa, it's the nonviolent left. It's the people running those think tanks, creating the narratives that create the conditions on which future violence can be executed. And that's why the violent phase can exist completely within inside the nonviolent. And that exists completely outside the red pill or the real world. So it's with this that we want to talk about the fact that how this gets applied. But if we were showing the, the briefing as it normally goes, this is where we would really start to talk about the insurgency pyramid after getting here, just to kind of give you continuity. But now we're going to talk about the, the narrative arc, the military engagement metaphor. Why? Because political warfare, for the people who wage it, it is warfare. And so we really want to get people off talking about this in narratives or in political science terms. Remember, political science is always about coming up with a political science model and then kind of populating how you understand the world based on that model. But models are always narratives. They're always narratives. So this military engagement model is about getting you to understand what you're seeing as if the people using these narratives were doing it to attack you, 
to defeat you, to destroy you. And the problem is it becomes so uncomplicated that the number one attack is that it's simplistic. It's not. It's simplified and it clarifies. Remember, it cuts through all that excessive narrative that we've heard people talk about that gets in the way of us understanding how clear it is, a constant theme in this briefing. So let's take a look. We're going to use the tactical engagement. This is very small level. You're in an engagement zone, and there you are. You're arrayed against a threat. And because we're willing, because we're using the red pill, blue pill matrix metaphor, we're flipping the, the, the traditional how military planners do forces because you're the blue team and the, uh, the enemy is the red team. We're flipping that because we're going to basically say we're the red pill players defending real things, whereas the blue pill players are enforcing the matrix, which is used to destroy your red pill um, values. So here you are, you're in a tactical engagement, a very close battle, and you're focused only on the threat to your immediate front. That's who you're fighting. But the problem is there's explosions going all over and you can't quite figure out where they're coming from. Why? Because you're actually in an impact area because you've been put there and you don't really understand that you are. In fact, you're fixed and bracketed by the narrative to your immediate front and you don't recognize that either. You're fixed and you're bracketed. Now, if you ever want to talk to military planners about what that means, it means you're in bad shape. Okay, so and while that's happening, you're being subjected to long range indirect fire. For people who are not under, familiar with military ease, indirect fire is long range howitzer fire that comes from over your, your visual range. Howitzers are what some people call cannons, but they're not, they're indirect fire. They fire on a loop and hit the target. So here's the problem from using this, 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 this analogy, the long range indirect fire analogy. You're unaware that it's even part of the attack. So there is no possibility of victory so long as the long range fires are not neutralized. In fact, they are the main effort. All red pill victories, you're fighting right there, all red pill victories in the engagement zone are temporary, limited, and tactical if you, if you define victory as defeating that blue pill force. And may not even be a victory because maybe they're only fighting that battle to reposition you to a better target zone. Engagements can be for defeat or for positioning. And an example will be hate speech. And we're going to show you what we mean by that. So the solution, it's really simple. Recognize that there is a deep battle. Recognize that victory depends on successfully engaging the red pill deep threat, not the blue pill close targets that exist to fix and bracket. Develop a strategy for engagement and destroy the deep strike targets. Remember, the deep threat is the main effort. The blue threat you're fighting in the engagement zone only exists to bracket fix you and then bracket you for those long range fires. And also remember this, while infantry in the engagement zone is the queen of battle, artillery is the king of battle, the red god of war. So, what are the targets? Well, it's the impact zone, but guess what? You're already receiving fire and you're taking severe damage. How about the trajectory? It's very difficult to hit incoming rounds, virtually impossible really, but you can adjust to incoming and you can track incoming rounds to the source. That's why I wanna point out here right now that that little thing you see up there, that little greenish thing is a counter battery radar. And what can it do? And what does it do in the real world? It picks up those, those rounds coming in and it is able to then use the radar to show where the firing, the long range fires are positioned and it can do it in real time. In fact, it could do it so quickly that if that counter battery radar is hooked up to counter battery artillery on your side, they can fire within, within seconds of picking up that situation and blow them up. So, What's the third, what's, what are the three targets? The firing system. That's the high payoff target. Actually in the political war, in our political warfare paradigm, it's the only target. And you see, you're in that impact zone in the close engagement and you're not aware that it's even there. So you're not doing your counter battery fire to see what the long range fire is and therefore you're not countering it. 
So let's take a look. Now that was the metaphor, long range fire, indirect fire. That's the military metaphor. And now we're gonna shoot, we're gonna redefine that arc as the narrative arc. Please, I've said this many times. It's always on a trajectory to a target for a purpose. What's the purpose? To destroy your real value, your red pill value that you, you exist for the sole purpose of defending. And remember, if you are in an engagement zone, you've already been targeted for a dialectical negation and defeat. Remember, the first thing you do on the actions on receiving fire is get out, break contact. So three targets, the impact. What is the particular negation formula? What is it targeting and for what purpose? You're receiving fire. You're supposed to instantly understand you're being fixed because somebody's got a long range fire on you. There is a narrative arc coming and it has a target. And you need to instantly understand what you're seeing that way. Understanding what's before you is about holding you down and keeping your eyes low. Okay. Two, trajectory. Walk back the narrative arc to the source to determine the identity targeted. What are they targeting for negation? And who is doing the, who is doing the targeting for negation? And finally, three, the firing system. Identify what is targeted for destruction and defend it in red pill terms. Never defend your red pill high value ideal using blue pill language because it means you're in the blue pill domain. You're trying to defend reality in the pseudo reality and attack the archetype form that that specific attack represents, which is to say you're attacking the dialectical enablers. Remember, the state is God, science of reason, et cetera. So let's take a look at this. Let's apply this dialectical engagement metaphor over time. And you're gonna see this is gonna to start to link into something. As you are bracketed by that close in that engagement zone in the close battle, those long range fires engage, you pick another target, engage again and again and again and again and again and again. See how that works? It's just like that until you're completely negated, until everybody even forgets what they were defending in America at the bottom because now they've been completely transitioned over to the blue pill domain and only understand it that way. So what can we take from this? The left never presents a hard target. It's always piecemeal. It's always just below the perceptual waterline so that you kind of feel a little uncomfortable calling out a target and surfacing the issue. You, you always feel just a little bit uncomfortable identifying the main actors doing the launch and then, and then defining what they're doing in terms of what they're actually doing because they haven't given you enough because you're relying only on what you're seeing and not developing them for your targeting purposes. They will never give you a target. The first thing they do when they attack you, even if it's not true, is put, you put a target on you. It's one thing they've denied us. So rolling forward here, in po political warfare parlance, this is a nonviolent line of operation we're talking about. And we're still talking about the narrative arc, okay? And we're talking about it here. I have engagement zone considerations with an asterisk. This is in play when failing to recognize the deep strike attack that maneuvers the mass line along and through the narrative arc, creating dialectical events along a period of praxis. So considerations to take into mind. One, actions in the engagement zone are often against blue pill threats that only exist to fix you in place. When you're in the engagement zone, only fighting the close attack, all you're, being, all you're doing is fixing yourself. The long range and narrative arc attacks are generally red pill attacks. Do you see what I did here? It's in a coat of blue pill. It's in a coat, that arrow is coated on the outside as blue because if you're taking the fire and you're fighting the blue pill threat in front of you, you're seeing that as somehow related to a blue pill attack. But underneath the long range fires are always red pill attacks. That attack is about taking what you're supposed to defend and attacking that where you're thinking you're only defending its manifestation in the close, in the close engagement. So not all engagements are for defeat. Some are for repositioning, to position for future attack, expose a high value target. So 
Again, I want to show you this metaphor I used again. While you jujitsu him at his own game, for as long as he requires, he never moves. He, his job is to hold you in place. And it is more than a flesh wound. So is this beginning to make sense? Is this beginning to make sense where I start to pull this together and show you some stuff? Because I want to go and talk about how these things work in a different way. But what I want to do first is give you the example of the hate speech paradigm and how it gets turned. And I'll give you another, another example, which will be food for thought. You're in the engagement zone and you're fighting the tactical engagement against the blue pill force in front of you. And you're oriented against him, oriented against the deep strike attack in the beginning. But remember, what you're actually doing in the hate speech narrative is defending something real. Red pill defenders are, in theory, supposed to be defending the First Amendment, free speech, and protected speech, which is something iconically American and vested at the core. The core of that is the First Amendment, and I'm not saying all free speech issues come from that. That's why you're there fighting that battle. That's the only reason you're in that battle. So hate speech targets American free, free speech principles and the First Amendment protections to be supplanted by international speech codes that are already being enforced extra legally. That's what social media is doing, in fact, right now. It is a Marxist attack narrative that only exists to destroy protected free speech. So long as you're battling that narrative, you are losing. So, Let's go and continue this. So what happens is you're focusing on the engagement zone and you're so focused on what's happening right in front of you, you don't understand the blue pill force is somewhat pivoting on itself and pivoting you. So now your direction of tactical engagement is sideways to the narrative arc. Well, let me explain this. As, a red, as the red pill team defends against the hate speech in the close battle by first accommodating and then adapting and adopting hate speech rhetoric. I'll fight fire with fire, or at least I'm going to understand their narrative and answer them along those lines in a maybe subconscious level at this point. The red pill language of defense is compromised when doing so by incrementally adopting blue pill language of the pseudo reality for red team defenses of real red team equities, free speech. The defense of protected speech is now sideways to the rights to be defended. Responding to blue pill movements in the close battle, the red pill force becomes sideways to the main red pill line of access. So what happens next? Adjusting to blue pill hate speech narratives, you spot in your, in your diligent battle a blue pill weakness that appears. And you all of a sudden conclude that when that weakness appears, you can jujitsu them at their own game by using their own red pill narratives against them. What just happened when you did that? I'm going to tell you what happened. Red pill defenses of a real interest are abandoned by blue pill bantering. Hate speech, a Marxist attack narrative that only exists to destroy protected free speech, is now the narrative on which you're defending free speech. And that won't happen. Red team defenders are converted to blue pill players, or really more accurately, red team defenders are converted to red pill attackers. And this is the point at which you will say, we're, we're fighting fire with fire. You know, it really doesn't help us, true red pill defenders of free speech. If you use that politically incorrect language and you realize, but that politically incorrect language only exists to enforce the blue pill narrative, which now you're enforcing against your own team, suppressing true uh, First Amendment and protected speech canons. And that's what you see here in this picture. Now you're turned completely, your direction of attack is in the attack of free speech. And that's how it works. Now I'd like to give you a mind bender, an example. Was the Trump impeachment truly successful for, the, for our side? Or was it successful for the other time? Was it actually one of these turning actions that the left engages in? Or could we retitle this, did the Republicans do a 180 on their constitutional mission? Okay. By accepting the extra legal star chamber process leading to the impeachment of Trump, did Republican leaders legitimize Marxist use of processes and tactics repugnant to the rule of law, 
the American sense of justice and due process, and the Constitution. And I would like to say, maybe they did. From the left's point of view, as a positioning strategy, the impeachment process was a strategic victory for the left. It green-lighted all the subsequent events, the, the, the COVID-19 enforcement narrative, where your elected leaders responsible for their constitutional mission and the rule of law completely abrogated them to completely arbitrary, internationally sanctioned um, COVID-19 narratives that had the effect of overruling civil rights. And did it just by fiat, not, not even real oversight on that decision to do so. How, how did they get away with that? It's really a, a, an important question. So let's just finish this jujitsu discussion that kind of runs through here. When attacking, the left has nothing to defend. Hence, a successful jujitsu counterattack accomplishes nothing tangible. Narratives are fictions. Because the left has nothing to defend, it can do narratives. Because there is something to defend, free speech and the hate speech paradigm here, you cannot rely on narratives. To defend something real, it, the defense must be true. True defenses are red pill defenses. Pseudo realities, blue pill attacks are designed to pull its reality based opposition into the pseudo reality in order to defeat its high value ideals, values, and assets. The most damaging aspect of jujitsuing a blue pill attack, defeating the left at its own game, is that while nothing meaningful can be won, the very act of engaging in the process institutionalizes the pseudo reality, the blue pill narrative, displacing the true red pill defense. You're beaten. This is now just a, a function of winding you down. So, you know, let's just point this out. Mr. Smith and his agents are red pill assets that function as deep strike assets that appear as blue pill players. When they're engaging you, they're there to destroy you. And they can always assume the form of a blue pill player. So how do you make that analogy? You can come up with quite a few. So I just want to go back and talk about the fact that that stuff we said at the very beginning, quoting Eric Vogelin, talking about how he, he, he identified Hegel as a, a wizard and his, 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 his dialectical equations as a grimoire. And then we could talk about how Bertrand Russell said the same thing in a little more philosophically clean terms. This is the game and that is the code. And that's what you have to crack. And you also have to get really comfortable at cracking that code. So I think this is our last Joseph Piper quote because Joseph Piper is so important. Because if the attack, if the left's main line of attack is nonviolent as the main action and it's narrative driven, this becomes the center of your countering what they're doing. What did he say? Joseph Piper. I wanted to say something far more discouraging is readily conceivable as well. The place of authentic reality is taken over by fictitious reality. My perception is indeed still directed toward an object, but now it is a pseudo reality a deceptively, deceptively appearing as being real, so much so that it becomes almost impossible anymore to discern the truth. When established Republicans, Jujits of the enemy in the blue pill domain, they no longer recognize the difference between the reality and the pseudo reality and the Republic will fall. Just look at what's not being enforced in this last year. So, Let's finish this up by talking about the narrative arc and the role of the main actor. And this becomes very important to, to maybe give a, 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 con a sense of what we're seeing today, because it brings with it mass line considerations. Whoops, sorry. And go and tie all this initiate language together that we had that might sound a little bit too peripheral ethereal to you, and it's actually not ethereal. It's what we have locked out of our analytical processes to our great detriment. Initiates know the lexicon and its relative positioning along the arc. Targeted groups, the people being targeted, the Republic, American citizens, their traditional views, they're just normal views. Targeted groups often fail to recognize either the lexicon or the arc. Initiates often use lexicons that have binary meanings. 
one for fellow initiates that they know. That's the language of the binary retreat. And one for everyone else. And the example I use is democracy again. So examples, milestones, Said Kutub's, Kutub's book, The Milestones, Politically Correct Narratives, The Dominant Narrative, The COVID-19 Narratives, which again, we treat as severable from COVID-19 itself. So let's just use the one we've been briefing for 10 years now. For the Islamic movement in the, in the United States, the dominant Islamic movement group is the, the Muslim Brotherhood. The early Meccan surahs indicate the MB concept of the Muslim Brotherhood concept of dawah, and therefore defense of jihad and violence on the fringe was what was allowed. And quoting those early surahs signaled that in the narrative arc. Whereas when it was time to escalate to violence, they are all in later surahs of the Quran. And therefore all they had to do was quote surah 9.5 or surah 9.25. And the message was sent to everybody who was an initiate those who are trained in the Islamic movement narrative, that it's time to become violent. So I use this narrative arc in a, in a, in a um, progression here in that sense. So what are the considerations we can use before I'll give you a couple other examples? When narrative arcs carry the message to the mob that events is command and control, then that narrative arc may be serving a mass line command and control function. When mobs show directionality and purpose, and that purpose conforms to preferred counter-state outcomes, it may not be a mob, it may be a mass line attack. Mass line communications always assume the legitimacy of the movement it imposes. It doesn't have to be stated. And the illegitimacy of the institutions it seeks to destroy. They're destroying them because they've already decided America is illegitimate. And Americans who believe that can be targeted. So let's take a look at rioting as the voice of the oppressed that we saw as the signaling that your elected leaders were not going to stop the violence in the street. That was followed by violence in the street by those same actors. The Minneapolis mayor, the Minnesota attorney general, and the Minnesota government authorizing mob violence against citizens. The question to ask is, how did the narrative arc define that statement? What was the initiate signal? What was the initiate signal? I'm sorry. How did the narrative arc define that statement? Was there an initiate meaning to the phrase that the arc clearly identified that, that was communicated to the people on the street from the people who are, in theory, your elected leaders? What was that? Rioting is the voice of the oppressed. How about, how about the generals when they said, they don't engage in political issues as if that was their Article II authority to make that determination when they then declared it a peaceful protest. United States senior general officer signaling mutiny, siding with the neo-Marxist less violent mob attacks on citizens through adopting the mass line political issues and peaceful protest narratives. How did that narrative arc define the statement? You know, I'm not saying that those generals understand that they conform to the Marxist narrative. In fact, this whole, this whole mass line narrative attack is premised on the fact that 90% of the people obey, obey because they're just following the directions of the narrative given to them. And they don't even need to understand that. So where was the initiate meaning to the phrase that the art clearly identified? Well, if you're a peaceful protest, that violence in the street, then resistance is actually what's going to be targeted. And there's no need to respond by you know, when people feel their lives are at risk by being attacked in the street to have the police respond or not have them respond in time. Well, this sounds outrageous, but that is how command and control narrative arcs work. And as a practical matter, we saw those narratives and we saw its exploitation on the street. So we're actually putting something out there that answers what we're seeing. So the question is, do the generals does the FBI, when they obey these things, do they understand those, those are narratives that are designed to get them to obey, that are positioned on purpose against the support and defend the Constitution quote? So if you go to re-remembering the mis misremembered left when we put it out, we created a generic mass line graphic, and here it is, the powering down. But all you have to do is put that little blue line there, and you could see how the narrative arc drives that mass line attack into the target. America and crashes through the rule of law. 
Did the COVID-19 narratives crush through the rule of law? Did social media and does social media shut people down for violating UN directives on COVID because the WHO is part of the UN? And does that mean that because the head of the UN and the head of WHO are Marxist that maybe American concepts of free speech has been subordinated to international standards that follow that norm? And where were your congressmen when they wanted to stop that? Because here's a pretty good graphic. You have the application. We've taught uh, intersectionality. We've showed it's, it's, it's critical race theory. So here you have the application from Marxism to critical theory, to critical race theory, to intersectionality, to the BLM mass line attack. Right there. You can't get any more purely Marxist than this. What happened? They powered down. They neutralized the FBI. They silenced the Republicans. And they directly intimidated and recorded the intimidation of citizens in the street terrorizing them. That, this does not get any cleaner than this. And there's the narrative arc that did it. And I'd just like to remind you that what we're seeing today is not dis distinguishable from Marx's quote from 1843, well over 20 years before Das Kapital, the people must be taught to be terrified of itself. And this is where I wanna point this out. Because this happens in the information battle space, everybody wants to have clouds and think theoretically and get into a political science model that tells you how to understand this by deracinating the events to the perfect model and then assigning events. There is absolutely nothing, there is absolutely nothing theoretical about this. Nothing theoretical about this. And that's what happened, that's what they plan to have happen, and that is what happened. And you know, it really raises the question um, that this is happening at the very time, as these events are happening, that the FBI has to be told to stop teaching, indoctrinating their own agency with critical race theory. So this is what you would call extreme strategic reality dislocation. So here's another example. Blue states want obedience. The blue states want obedience on wearing masks even as peer reviewed science doesn't really support that claim. Excuse me. Respect ensures mass line enforcement of that deep state objective without having to say so and be held holding bad science when it kind of shows that maybe that's not really where things were at. Operation Respect is what came out of it, and it relies on fear-driven mass line intimidation to compel obedience. What is the fear? The fear is they're telling you your mother might die if that guy over there doesn't wear a mask, and therefore you're not wearing a mask is disrespectful to them, and that gives them the right, that gives them the right to intimidate you even into violence. Is that not what you're seeing? Are you not, in the name of respect, seeing the, the blue states enforce a mass line narrative? And is it not being enforced at the threat of violence that, of course, that deep state can walk away from and say, we didn't authorize it? How many times do these things have to happen before people understand that that's, that's how these things roll? When narrative arcs, and you've heard this before, I just want to reinforce it. When narrative arcs carry the message to the mob, that evidence is command and control. Excuse me. When narrative arcs carry mass line messages to the mob that evidence is command and control, the narrative arc may be serving a mass line command and control function. When mobs show directionality and purpose, and that purpose conforms to preferred counter state outcomes, it may not be a mob at all, but a mass line attack. And a mass line attack is a neo-Marxist attack that follows Mao's long march strategy, which was the long march strategy that brought the People's Republic of China to become under the control of the communist nationalists. This is pure Marxism. This isn't a variant. This isn't something that borrows from it. And the very fact that our people who put themselves on the picket line defending against these attacks, the laws to go right by them, tells you about the strength of our picket. It's like manning a submarine with screen doors and giving you a target 10 feet in front of you that can't fit through the screen door, all the while the water is flooding the whole thing and then telling you you're not allowed to close the uh, the flood, the flood doors. That's, that's really where we're at right now. A couple more considerations. Playback is the idea that the left throws out a narrative and they want to hear us echo it back. And if we echo back the terms they create, that means they have us obeying their narrative. And does the, what do the generals say? 
peaceful protest? Do they say, do they say political event in a, in a very suspect way? Does it have them ignoring the actual violence on the street that the president of the United States under his article two authority against all enemies for domestic have the absolute authority if he ever chooses to, to order the military to do that? Has the military ever done that in history? It has done it a lot. The Department of Defense has been allowed to read itself out of its constitutional mission, which is always subordinate to the President of the United States. So what playback assessments were used to institute the COVID-19 narratives, but now with the COVID-19 narratives in place, what playback assessments were used to ensure transition to downstream mass line events? The BLM Antifa violence that came within the zone of that COVID-19 narrative, which whenever that lost traction, they could revert to the dominant suppressive narrative and that sustained irrational suppression of the population. The relative balance between subjects who obey and citizens who discern by being informed while seeking due process. Do you see that those narratives have created distinction there between citizens and subjects? Subjects obedient to arbitrary authority who could be told that people are being respectful are pitted against citizens who expect a rational scientific basis for imposed medical restrictions that impact civil liberties that reflect what? A direct nexus? Does your shutdown have a direct nexus to the precautions in question from a, from a actual scientific medical epidemiological basis? Did you state them? Did you prove them? A, a reasonably tailored and minimally invasive action to be taken to do that? Was that done or did you go straight to shutdown where the people whose oath is to support and defend the constitution suspended them and in the, in, in the process suspended your civil rights? Does it reflect a reasonably, do those decisions reflect reasonably settled science that includes pre-event peer reviewed scrutiny? All these things are brought into question. And I think arguments could be count, used to show that in each of those events that didn't happen. But even if you could show they did happen, that process was never followed at all. So, are the COVID-19 narratives attack on citizens living in a free society? Social media censors non-conforming media that violates WHO standards. WHO, a UN organization, is controlled by a Marxist. The UN General Secretary is a Marxist, a socialist. American social media censors American voices, including real experts based on extra legal speech standards that favor international forums under Marxist leadership while suppressing the protected speech of American citizens inside the United States. That's just the real fact. When the defining characteristic of a, of COVID, of a COVID-19 narrative appears to be undermining civil liberties, when that seems to be the dominant effect, isn't that, shouldn't that be assessed as the purpose? And so long as someone can make the argument, they don't even have to win the argument, but credibly make the argument, Shouldn't we be allowed to expect the people who are sitting in our Congress, judges who have the, have the duty to make decisions, make decisions along that, along that rule of law arc that the Constitution exists to suspend? So let's, let's finish, finish up these considerations. Executing along a narrative arc denies those outside the initiate group to be able to first identify and then target what's happening. This renders all your responses partial you sound incomplete or over the top. You're either over-inclusive or under-inclusive to the target set. You're trying to respond to what the left is saying and you either overshoot the target or undershoot it. You, you overshoot it because you sound too heavy-handed or over-broad or too concrete. Because remember, they're always operating under the waterline and they're, not, and they're not giving you a hard target and you're not developing those targets to the point where you can show that they're real or you're under-inclusive and you want to sound too philosophical. You want to create a political science model in which you can generically talk about it, realizing that everything that you said generically existed to keep you from talking about what was really happening. Under-inclusive and abstract. This opens the target, you, when you're the target of these attacks, this opens the non-initiate to ridicule. You will be ridiculed. And remember, we showed that that's built into the equation of the, of the um, science of reason narrative of using false science to make you sound like you're uneducated. It's not just that it's not just individuals. Once you're in a pseudo reality, once you're in that blue pill world, 
It's not just individuals, but also the stage itself that carries the message. It's the narrative arc that carries the message, not the spokesperson in it. The main role of principal actors can often be in support of the narrative, which carries the message. Let's give the matrix analogy. It's not just what a blue pill actor says or does. It's also that it's completely supported by the matrix, the pseudo reality. In fact, it's the matrix that instantiates the blue pill actor, not the other way around. The blue pill actor would sound ridiculous outside that matrix. That's why they might spend 10 or 20 years building that narrative that goes all the way back to when you first saw those coexist bumper stickers a long time ago those hate bumper stickers a long time ago. That's how far back they were. That's when political correctness became a term. That's when they started building these analogies today. Controlling the matrix, the left can prevail on slogans and Twitter because it owns the narrative and it owns the arc. It's the left pseudo reality. We cannot win in that reality because it only exists to negate you. Whenever you do a, whenever you fight against the matrix, whenever you fight against the pseudo reality in the pseudo reality, you are creating a point defense along a narrative arc that will just simply fix you in place as it bypasses you. Military people will understand exactly that point. The left can sustain simplistic slogans that are intentionally simplistic so that when the target group, when you respond in kind, you sound like a simpleton because their statements are not, because when you do it, your statements are not supported by the narrative and they're not supported by the narrative arc. But their simplistic statements are supported by the narrative arc. The narrative defines what they say, so a simple Twitter line can mean something. When someone says red alert as they go to St. Louis a couple days ago, you say, well, they're being rhetorical. And yet there you see them in the streets with a large group of people with a U-Haul pulling over, handing out Antifa material. And you don't pick up the point that a red alert was sound or condition red or something like that. And it was followed. Command and control. All non-initiate responses will be point attacks on a specific data point along the arc, which is either sloughed off to fix non-initiates in that place or just used to bypass them altogether. Again, this renders all of your successful point engagements where you wanna fight against that hate, where you wanna fight against this, where you wanna fight against that. That causes you to deploy on a point on an enemy which wants to fix you on a point so they can go right past you. This renders all successful point engagements temporary hollow. Don't be the Germans at the Battle of the Bulge where all they had to do was put a small fixing force in front of our people and use their main force to bypass it. When they displaced to fight us at the Battle of the Bulge, they lost the initiative and they lost the battle. Same with Santa Ana at the Alamo. Don't be them. So we're gonna, we're gonna uh, end this brief at this time. There's another other narrative art considerations. Uh, so pseudoscience, pseudo realities, conspiracy theories, but we're going to put that off to another day, in part because they're still being built out and because they're going to take something of an explanation. So with that, we will end this briefing uh, today, and I hope to follow up uh, with other things later. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. Take care. Bye-bye.